evening, everyone. Welcome to this author interaction of 2022 NLF Reading Challenge. My name is Kartika, and I'm very excited to be here. We hope you are too. Before we begin the interaction, do allow me to give you a brief introduction to the NLF Reading Challenge, followed by a few housekeeping rules for today's session. The NLF Reading Challenge is a four month long reading event from March to June, 2022, for students between 10 to 13 years of age. It runs for students across India on the competitive and the non-competitive tracks. In addition to fun book-based activities and regular author interactions, the challenge will conclude with a quiz competition that will see the three best teams win gold, silver, and bronze in great trophies respectively, certificates of achievement, and a great set of books. For today's event, please use the Q&A box to type out your questions or your responses to what's being discussed during the session. If you're a student, a teacher, or a school librarian, please mention the name of your school along with your question as well. Today, we are privileged to have with us the award-winning author, Patrice Lawrence. Patrice was born in Brighton, England, raised in an Italian Trinidadian family in mid-Sussex, and now lives on the South Coast. Her debut YA novel, Orange Boy, won the Bookseller YA Prize and the Waterstones Prize for Older Children's Fiction and was shortlisted for the Costa Children's Book Award. Her subsequent novels have been much acclaimed and frequent visitors to prize lists. Eight Pieces of Silver, published by Hodder in August 2020, won the Jhalak Children's and Young Adult Prize 2021. Patrice has been nominated for the Carnegie Medal six times. Patrice was also awarded an MBE for services to literature in the Queen's Birthday Honours 2021. Welcome, Patrice. We're very happy to have you with us today. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Patrice. I'm sure our audience is really keen to hear more from you. Would you like to do a reading from your book for us? OK, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning of that. Because um, I think it's a bit strange starting in the middle because nobody knows who anybody is. So chapter one, Al. I'm hungry. I want to fill the biggest bowl with cornflakes and then pile on sugar and milk and mix it all together. It doesn't have to be normal milk. Chocolate milk would be even better. I'd finish all the cornflakes and scrape the bowl until it squeaked. Then I'd munch down three slices of toast with peanut butter and chocolate spread with a squished banana on top. After that, some crackers and cheese. But all that food is in my head. I don't want to get off my bed and go into the kitchen because we haven't got no cornflakes, no chocolate spread, no cheese, no peanut butter. We've got milk because Gran dropped it round. But I don't think we've got nothing I can pour milk over. We do have sugar, so maybe I can mix it into the milk and drink that instead. There's another reason why I don't want to go into the kitchen. I'd have to pass mum. She's on the sofa in a mood. She's been trying not to have big moods since I started living with her again. We're supposed to be starting over. Mum's promised that she'll never go near the people that make her want to take drugs. She's promised that she'll never steal anything again. She's promised that it was the last time she'd go to prison. She's promised she'll make herself get better and strong. Mum didn't promise just promise me. She promised Gran and my social worker too. But I think she's finding it hard to keep her promises. So it's an opening paragraph. Really hard hitting opening paragraph as well. Opening chapter, opening paragraph. Thank you for that, Patrice. So one of the things that we that you know that really strike us while we're reading the book um, is that while it gives us a glimpse of what hunger and urban poverty looks like, it also deals with emotional and mental issues that uh, mental health issues that characters are grappling with, like Al's mom, um, who's just out of prison. And so there's difficult themes like there's drug abuse, there's neglect. Um, and this is a book for young readers, for middle graders. So when you were writing it, did you think about how you'd want to negotiate these themes for them? There's, yeah, yeah there's Al's matter of fact and narration and there's his resilience. Uh, but in addition to that, was there something that you thought of? Yes, absolutely. All of those things. I think perhaps because um, when my daughter was, was a child in the area, we were growing up in London and at her school, there were a lot of children negotiating 
those challenges and dealing with that you know there are actually lots of children experiencing that and London is one of those cities where there's a lot of wealth but there's a lot of poverty and that kind of doesn't always get people don't those children don't have voices I think one of the in the first drafts I didn't explicitly mention the drugs but actually it came back saying you know put it in and it's not an explicit thing it's just that's Al's life so and for me because I write to children I my real I suppose my mantra is is to do no harm to children so I want to really think about how children who might be affected by those issues feel when they read my books so it's actually constantly on my mind Right, and you've spoken about that as well multiple times on um, how you keep your readers in mind when you're writing. And one of the things that also struck us, Patrice, while we were reading and while we were reading about your past work, um, one of the things that you've talked about is the fact that that you decided to start writing and you found your own voice when you realized that people of color can be represented in literature, in stories. Um, there's the fact that you've done 20 years of work before you were a full-time writer working with charities that support social justice. Um, there's Al in the book who uses and who chooses to have rats as his friends, uh, who seem to be like a metaphor for his own existence. Um, he's, he's hidden away, he's not treated well by his peers, his mother and the other people in his building are viewed with suspicion. Um, and so was it when you write, when you began writing, was it a conscious choice to give this demographic visibility? That's one part of the question. And another part of the question, and which speaks to what you said about how you think about your readers when you're writing, what would it have, it have been like for young Patrice when you were growing up to have read grown-up Patrice's work um, at that time? These are two massive questions. <laughs> I suppose the first question, absolutely deliberate to give Al a voice. I think there were so many children and young people and adults who don't have a voice and I think there are a lot of stereotypes um, and we as human beings are complicated and we have so many stories and only so many stories get told and I, I passionately believe that stories can change the world and that by giving a and the, the school that actually it got used um, by Book Trust which are a big literacy charity in, in the in the UK in England and they gave a lot of schools a free copy of Rat so I was in a school yesterday and a lot of young people had it and I was signing it. And it's actually created a lot of discussions around particular food poverty, because it's a massive issue in you know, England, which is such a rich country, but there's so many children that haven't got enough to eat, haven't got proper food. There's a lot of issues as well that I learned working in, you know, around um, organisations of social justice about experiences, particularly of women in prison and how difficult it is and how many of them are mothers and how their children are looked after by someone else. And I've interviewed some in the past as well, some mothers whose children have been fostered. And how do you build that relationship again? How do you trust each other again? And also simply money. So London is incredibly expensive, really expensive. So if you're coming out of prison, where do you live? If you can't get any money, how do you feed your child? And it's the real sort of issues that so many people talk about. So I explicitly wanted to explore those in the book. In terms of your second question, it's actually when I go into schools, I talk a lot about this, about how growing up, because my mother came from Trinidad and it's a colonial country at that time. So her whole, edu whole education was books by white British authors uh, or white American authors, <laughs> never Trinidadian authors um, or Trinidadian Indian authors. And there's a few of those as well. <laughs> but it was always, you know, it's a Shakespeare. And, you know, and I love those books, but actually stories are so much more. But what you absorb as a child, particularly when I was growing up, where the only children of colour in children's books were terrible, terrible, quite often racist stereotypes. And there were no writers that looked like me. So I loved writing and I loved reading. But I just thought, I can't be an author. I could never, it just did not, I could, I was more likely to be an astronaut than I was to be an author because it did not. And it was just, I think, you know, if I could read those, those books now, I think I would have started, I've had so much more confidence in my own stories. I wouldn't write books that only had white characters because I didn't believe that we couldn't be in books. I would, um, hopefully what I can do, even a bit late, <laughs> is now go into schools and just tell young people from poorer backgrounds, from you know, young people of colour, that actually you can be writers. You, are, you should see yourselves in books and that your stories are really important. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, we actually had the privilege of interacting with Emily Drabble from Book Trust last year ah. when, when we did the Lit Fest online. And so she spoke about your book. She spoke about your book. She spoke about Kerry and Gettin's book. So it's all very exciting. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Um, so coming back to Rat and just focusing on a character, the character of Al Patrice, there's while we're so while we sort of delve into the book, we see that we can as a reader, there's a constant sense of dread that he's either going to fall off the precipice, um, something really precarious is he seems like he's in a really precarious situation, or he needs to pull himself back. Um, and so it feels like we constantly see what could happen if he falls off the precipice because we see the conditions that he lives in, we see that um, he has little access to facilities to for him to lead a healthy, happy life. But on the other hand, we see his sister, his stepsister Plum, who's studying for college and she's working and she's supporting herself and him um, and she's able to feed him. And so it feels like there's these two sides to the story. There's the light in Plum and there's the dark in all of the situations, the circumstances that Al faces. Was that a conscious choice that you had to balance these two out? Absolutely, because um, there's a writer, an African-American writer and journalist called Christopher Myers. And you know the saying about books, children's books should be like a window you look through, a sliding door you step through and um, a mirror that reflects you. But what he also said is that children's books can be like a map and you can read books and see where you can go. So and because I do write about children who have had difficult experiences, I do want other children who share those experiences to know there's hope and, you know, hope all around you. And sometimes when things are bleak and when you are near that precipice, that there will be someone who can pull you back. And I think there are lots of particularly, you know, lots of young women like Plum who have really probably not had it that great themselves, but they are trying and they're trying and they're trying to bring people with them. So I kind of wanted to sort of celebrate those really resilient, kind, generous, probably old before their time young women who are trying hard to help the others. Yeah, and it's very cleverly done. It's understated. It's never explicitly said. And so the reader sort of reflects and absorbs that by oneself. So it was nice to know Plum through the book. <laughs> Good. <laughs> she have... probably isn't happy to be called Plum, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We have an interesting audience question that's come in for you, um, Patrice, from Lauren Lee, who says, was there a Mr. Breaker in your life? whom you based him off of? <laughs> That's a great question. No, but I suppose he's kind of like that person in school tells the teacher when you've done something <laughs> naughty. But interestingly enough, um, Pete and Tyrone are kind of inspired by people I knew. So I lived on a social housing block um, and I was a, a lone parent with my, my daughter. And I was, you know, I was fine. I was working. I was a governor at the school, you know, all of that. But I had two neighbours, Pete and Tyrone, who didn't have very much. And they were worried that I was a bit <laughs> vulnerable. So they used to come and put up shelves for me. But also they used to, um, with some of the neighbours that were very vulnerable, they used to knock on their door, make sure they're OK. They used to cook a big Sunday meal for them and take them to people who couldn't come. So part of actually it was around celebrating community. Um, but I think there's a Mr. Breaker in quite a lot of places, actually, who's that person who at first you don't know their story, you think they're grumpy, you think they're miserable, but everybody has a story. You know, we all, we don't all start off that way. So I'm quite interested in finding out different people's stories about why you like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And speaking about Mr. Breaker um, and the fact that he, there is more to him than meets Al's eye, and we learn more about him as the story progresses. So without giving away too many spoilers, um, right at the beginning, it's Mr. Breaker who calls out to Al and sort of calls attention to the fact that this boy might be shoplifting when Al didn't intend for, to do that, but his mum was caught for shoplifting. Um, and we sort of learn more about Mr. Breaker as the story progresses. And so therefore, I, for all the other readers also who've read Rat, and for me, why is it that Mr. Breaker decides to call uh, attention to Al, is it because he wants to, is it because he wants acceptance with the store? Is it because he wants to prevent Al from breaking into the cycle of, of crime, um, small crime? Um, what was running through his mind when he did that? When I was writing it, what I was thinking was actually he wasn't even thinking about Al, he was thinking about the mother. And he's, because 
<laughs> no spoilers, but because of his own life, he is very conscious of people knowing about his past. He thinks people know about him. He thinks that Elle's mum is deliberately playing her music loud just to annoy him. And I think it's just, I think he's also someone that's quite afraid as well. And I think when people are afraid, they just kick out at the easiest thing. Um, so that's, so when at the beginning, I just kind of almost wanted him to be like that villain and then like show bits. So yeah, for him, he thinks that Elle's mum is just moved in and she's just there to annoy him. And also he looks after his mum, doesn't he? His sick mum. So he's also very conscious about his sick mum, um, sort of having, you know, doesn't want loud music and all of those things. So it's a mix of things. I think a lot of it's fear. And we, we don't always do good things when we're frightened. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to see Mr. Breaker is uh, more human and more grey than black. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's why. And I think the thing is about, you know, it's we're so easy sometimes to say somebody's bad. And actually, it's trying to understand why people do what they do. And I think and I don't really want to write somebody's an out and out villain. It'd be great fun, but I might leave that to Disney. So <laughs> it's just not in my books. Thanks for that, Patrice. Uh, we have a writing question that's come for you from the audience. There's Arav Chowji who asks you, uh, what are your strategies that you use to write? Are there any particular strategies that you use? Yes, I mean, I always start with characters and I'm really interested in what makes human beings human beings. Um, and I usually know their situation. So with that, I knew that he, I knew I was going to write about a boy. I knew his age. I knew that his mum would be in prison. Um, I knew that it would have rats. I don't know why, because I hate rats. I absolutely had to ask lots of people <laughs> who'd have pet rats because I cannot stand them. Um, so I, I kind of knew that. So I always start with a character and a situation. And then for me, the next three things I think about my character is one, what do they want? Because that's the goal is usually, and sometimes they don't even know, but they have to start off wanting something. So at the beginning, I'll want food. And that's quite a simple thing, but gradually it's more that he wants his mum back. He wants, you know, a home. So they always start off wanting something. Uh, secondly, I quite often give them a fear as well, something they're afraid of, because your job as a writer is to be really terrible and give them more, give them more of it. Are you afraid of heights? Then you put them on a higher building, you know. And then just sometimes I also give them something, um, a precious object. So, for instance, I've got a little book. My My father passed away when I was in my early 20s and he gave me... It's given me a little book for my seventh birthday and it's extracts of like Keats and uh, John Donne and Shakespeare, but love poetry or plays and stuff. And that's my precious object. And so sometimes we'll give somebody a precious because then again, as a writer, you're terrible and you take it away from them. <laughs> so those are, those are the things I start with. Then I try sometimes when writing particularly a bigger book, I try and write the last scene before I finish. So I have some sort of map of where I'm going. Um, and then the last thing is I usually have a uh, ingredients that I want to put in there. So I knew that I would have a step stepsister called Plum because I'm an oldest sister. So I looked after my brothers quite a lot. They're much younger than me. So I kind of know that role. I knew I wanted a grandma to be quite a younger modern grandma and not kind of stereotype grandma. I mean, I know grand grandparents in their 40s and 50s were working and I knew and sort of knew that. And then... Um, Mr. Breaker's mother, I kind of knew how I wanted her to be because I've got a friend who's in her 80s and, you know, she's a march for, in protest. And so it just made me think about that a little bit as well. Um, and I knew Pete and Tyrone were going to be <laughs> definitely. So I kind of have this, these ingredients as well. Oh, that's fascinating. I hope Arav, who asked you the question, has taken note and he's um, going to try and use some of those strategies himself. Uh, so since you spoke about grandmothers and modern grandmothers and um, empowered women like Plum, um, I was also reminded of the fact that when in your interviews, you've talked about how you've spoken with grandparents who are caring for children because their parents are often either battling addiction issues or they're in prison. Um, and these are grandparents who are strong, um, who are figures of authority, who are decisive. Um, there's also the fact that you've written two books with grandmothers as heroes. There's our protagonists, whereas Granny came here on the Empire Windrush, and there's Granny Ting Ting. So is there a connecting thread between how you view grandmothers as fierce and empowered and how you want to put them front and center in your books? Um, and there's, <laughs> it's quite funny because my the first time I went to Trinidad, um, I was six. Um, my mum 
was the second youngest. So she had, there was 12 of them. So she was the only one who came to England and she was the second youngest. And so I sadly went to Trinidad the first time for my granddad's funeral and met my grandma. She was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I mean, she'd had 12, 13 children, so I'm not surprised. And she wasn't interested in me at all because she'd already had, one of my aunties had 13 children. So she already had so many grandchildren. I was just like another one. And also we had different accents as well. So she um, had uh, you know, a Trinidadian accent. I had an English accent, so we couldn't understand each other. So I think that was wish fulfillment. Um, my mum has an older sister, though, uh, called Auntie Baby. I can't remember. Nobody knows her original name. So she's Auntie Baby. And Auntie Baby is now in her 90s. But um, she's the person who used to write me lots of letters from Trinidad when I was little, send me gold bracelets, um, all of these things. And so she was like the substitute grandmother. And then on my biological father's side, his mother was uh, Indian Guyanese. And I know nothing about that heritage whatsoever, which is a real pity. So I think actually one of these things when you're a writer, you can kind of write your wishes, I suppose. So that like, I wish I had a grandma <laughs> like that. But also I suppose my daughter's... Um, dad's mother her paternal grandma Hilary is one of my favorite people in the world she's utterly amazing so I think a lot of it is almost like a little homage to her as well so yeah I think I'm probably slightly obsessed with grandparents <laughs> but I think there's something lovely about that intergeneral intergenerational relationship about how you pass your family stories down and your histories and it's such a different relationship so I kind of like we'll just celebrate that as well oh that's so nice to hear thank you for that Patrice we're going to now see Granny Ting Ting with new eyes. Sorry? We're going to now see Granny Ting Ting, the book with new eyes. Well, yeah, it's, it's inspired by my auntie baby, actually. <laughs> so. It's excellent. Um, so, Patrice, we're, we're about seven minutes away from wrapping up. Um, so I'll ask you a slightly longish two-part question again. Now, one of the things that, that really strikes us when we look at your writing journey is that you've written so many different types of books. You've written... Um, pretty realistic fiction, like with Rat and Orange Boy and Indigo Donut. Um, you've written a reboot of Enid Britton's Mallory Towers, where you've said that you've introduced a girl like yourself um, in Mallory Towers. You've, uh, <laughs> you've written a fantasy series that's come out now for young readers called The Elemental Detectives. Um, and you've also spoken about how when you were a child, you read a lot of mysteries. You read a lot of Sherlock Holmes. You also read a lot of Tolkien while you were growing up. Um, and how you've always liked being a part of fandoms, like you like being a part of the K-pop fandom or music-related fandoms or the Mandalorian fandom. Um, <laughs> Give me a fandom, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about what it's been like to work with these different genres? Um, and also, do you hope that the Elemental Detectives will spawn its own fandom someday? <laughs> Excellent question. I think well, I, suppose, I suppose maybe I need to go back to my, in a sense, my childhood. So the childhood I had was, um, in a sense, not typical for anybody really. So growing up with a, being brought up by my Italian stepfather since I was four, and then my mum in England. But then before that, I lived with um, a white working class family in Brighton because my mum wasn't able to look at me after me because she was working. So I've lived in lots of different families of lots of different influences. So from the early and think from the earliest stages, I've never really put things in those sort of um, type sort of genres. Everything could be everything. And even though, for instance, you know, my stepdad worked in the kitchens at hotels, we had a fish and chip shop, you know, so we weren't middle class, but we'd go to Italy and look at all the Renaissance pictures and all the museums and go to Florence. And so I think I've never really fitted into that box. So for me, stories are stories and you just find different ways of, of telling them. But I think for me, there's also many central things. And I think it's going back to the idea of representation. So with Elemental Detectives, it's putting two black children in 18th century London. And there are lots of black people and lots of people of colour in 18th century London. But you, it's never sort of really acknowledged. But also it's like black children can be heroes. They can fight the dragons, they can, you know, all of those things. Um, and also there's also an element of social justice because Robert in that he was enslaved in the plantation in Barbados and brought over. So there's often been lots of discussion about, you know, could you be a slave in England? Well, you could because people were, they were brought over. So you can sort of wiggle little things in there as well. Um, and I suppose a lot of it's also celebrating my heritage, I think, as I grow to understand it and think about 
my mum must have, you know, she was probably 19 or 20 when she got on that boat over to England by herself, you know, no internet, no transatlantic telephone. And that's such a massive thing. And there were still people making those migration journeys, aren't there? So there's a lot of that celebration, you know, as well. So I love all genres. I love popular culture as well. I mean, I'll go to a concert and I'll go, I've seen, you know, I'll go to opera, I'll go to classic music, classical music. But I sort of love the joy of the fandoms of K-pop and, um, and you know, Korean drama and how people from all over the world. And my daughter actually went to see that the K-pop band BTS when they came to England um, a few years ago. She booked the tickets a year before and by the time it came around she wasn't so much into them but she said I paid so much money mummy <laughs> I'm going to say she queued for 15 hours <laughs> but she said actually what she loved was that the people were so diverse in all ways so I think that's such a when a world can be so divided I think fandoms are so gorgeous because they just bring people together who just love it and that's quite joyous I think oh that's delightful what a lovely note to end our session on <laughs> Thank Indeed, you so joy. much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrice, for joining us today. This has been absolute half, just a wonderful half hour. Thank you. And wish thank you, you for inviting me. It was a really lovely thing to do. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Wish you all the very best with all your new writing and all your important appointments that you have to do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Patrice. See you. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Bye.